Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Komal Sayed, and I'm a PhD candidate at University of California, Irvine. I'm being co-advised by Professors Martha McCartney and Professor Will Bowman. Um, I'm excited to show, present my results today about our recently accepted paper in Material Journal, which basically uh, correlates the green boundary segregation in multi-phase ceramics to the difference in print techniques. I would really encourage you to explore the paper um, on your own time for more details and discussions of, the, uh, of our findings, um, as this, this talk is more of a short summary. So just to go over the outline of the talk, I will talk about why the green boundary segregation matters, why do we even care about it, um, what's the need for studying multi-phase ceramics, and how we expect or hypothesize the single phase and multi-phase performance to be different in terms of green boundary segregation. Then I will go over the experimental methods, um, including the sintering techniques that we used, as well as the scanning transmission electron microscopy characterization. And then finally, I'll go over our findings, both qualitative and quantitative observations that, we, uh, uh, that, that are presented in our paper for green boundary segregation at the interfaces in the three-phase ceramic. And I will conclude with the important points of our paper. It is well known in the scientific community that green boundaries uh, basically control the bulk properties. Um, and the structure and composition of green boundaries will directly impact the final properties of the resulting material. For instance, um, if you have green boundary segregants present at the, um, you know, at the interface, uh, it, they can reduce the phonon propagation and can affect, that can affect, directly affect the thermal conductivity. Similarly, any presence of um, um, uh, grain boundary segregation at the, uh, at the interfaces would also change the fracture properties. And there are many, many other properties that have been explored in terms of their relationship to the grain boundary chemistry. However, the issue is that most of the studies that have been done in the past are focused on single phase ceramics and bicrystal. And while this is um, honestly great systems to look for when you are trying to simplify the system and focus on what kind of uh, grain boundary uh, segregation you observe, they, there is still a major gap which relates the grain boundary segregation to what really happens in the real world ceramics. Because in most engineering ceramics, they're actually multi-phase. So we don't, we don't know for sure that the studies that we are doing on bicrystals and single phase ceramics, are they really translating to the properties observed in the real world ceramics. So for this study, we used a three-phase polycrystalline ceramic composed of eight mole percent UPS stabilized zirconia in cubic phase, alumina, as well as spinel. Now these three ceramics are widely used technical ceramics. They have been independently studied um, uh, for grain boundary segregation behavior. And for us, this is a great, a great base model because we can use these independent previous studies to compare results with multi-phase ceramics that we are using in our study. Furthermore, these uh, phases are good because they do not react with each other during centering and do not form any secondary phases and they're stable. And they're generally available as both powders and single crystals. And they have many other properties, which I'll be welcome to talk about later if anybody has questions. As you would expect, the multi-phase ceramic systems have um, huge variety of interfaces depending on how complex your system is. For our system, we have three phases as I mentioned, alumina, spinel, and YSD. What you're seeing on your left is a schematic diagram of how you would expect different interfaces to, uh, you know, uh, how you would expect different variety of interfaces. And on the right, you are seeing an actual bright field TM image of one of our centered samples. And you can see there's a huge diversity of interfaces. So this complex system contains three HOMO interfaces. For those who are not familiar, HOMO interfaces is just the grain boundaries between two similar phases. So we have spinel-spinel interface, uh, YSV-YSV interface, and alumina-alumina interface. And then we also have three hetero interfaces between YSV-spinel, YSV-alumina, as well as alumina-spinel. Now we hypothesize that our multi-phase system should show distinct segregation compared to the single phase uh, systems that have been studied before. And I want to start by giving you an example as a motivation and I will, I mean, I will conclude, the, uh, conclude with that at the end also to basically bring the picture of this whole paper together. So for example, here you will see some variation in grain boundary segregation observed at YSV grain boundary. So when you have a single phase YSV system, it's actually 
there are many, many publications on that. I'm just referring here for one for your reference that you can check it out. But yttrium segregation is observed very commonly as yttrium st uh, stabilizes zirconia grain boundaries. However, when a dopant such as alumina is included in YSZ, research has shown that both yttrium and aluminum segregate at the grain boundary. That should make us think that that means that when you're adding these different components to the system, the segregation behavior is changing. Thus, therefore, what really happens when we have a three-phase system? Would our YSZ grain boundaries only show yttrium segregation? Would they show both yttrium and alumina segregation or would something else happen? So we will find out during the, uh, during the course of the talk. So I'll go over the experimental techniques that we use. But before, I just want to give a brief overview of what sintering is for those who may not be very familiar. So sintering is simply the densification of powder into solid, a solid mass of material. So you start with a uh, loose powder, which you press into a compact. Um, uh, and then finally, the, this compact or pellet is fired at very high temperatures for long periods of time. And uh, uh, because of diffusion, these powders basically, you know, join at, uh, you can see here, the, the, these powders will join together. And that's where the grain boundaries will form. So the final centered body would have both grains, grain boundaries. And of course, it's, it's not very typical to get 100% dense ceramics. So you will also get some pores. Now, we, as we already talked about that, a single phase and a multi-phase system, the, complex, the complexity is very different in a multi-phase system. But to further add to that, there are many, many ways to actually center a sample. The one that I just talked about in the previous slide was conventional sintering, where you do high temperatures at long sintering time. However, this is not the only way to center. And there, in, uh, in the past several decades, there have been more and more um, uh, uh, research done to basically improve the sintering time or you know fast in it uh, for energy and cost saving. So flash sintering is one of the techniques that is relatively newer in the past decades. In this technique, electric field is applied directly to the sample and this causes the sample to densify in as quickly as within few seconds. Another technique which is also a field assistive technique is called spark plasma sintering or I would refer to it as SPS for the rest of the talk. This one not just uses electric field, but also uses pressure as a stimulus. And then instead of uh, putting the electric field directly on the sample, the sample is contained in a graphite dye. So you can see that there's a huge variation in all of these methods. And there's many other centering methods, but these are the three we chose for our, um, for our project. So what we are trying to find out here is how will sintering parameters and external stimuli like, like electric field and pressure will actually affect the grain boundary segregation. But before we answer that, let's find out how significant our parameters are uh, you know, varying. So for the conventional center sample, we centered at 1550 Celsius for 10 hours. For flash center sample, uh, we centered at 1450 Celsius uh, however, because the electric field passes through the sample, which causes dual heating, and the sample temperature can reach as high as 1700 Celsius, which we confirm using in-situ in reading. And this sample was only centered for six seconds. And finally, the SPS sample was centered at 950 Celsius for five minutes, but also has an additional pressure applied to it of 100 megapascals. And you can see there's a huge variation, not really a huge, but within, you know, uh, uh, several hundreds of nanometers. There's a variation in, um, in grain sizes. Now to make things more complicated for us, we also want to know what would happen if we, because generally after centering, there's very common to anneal for different times. So we wanted to explore what would happen if a sample is annealed, um, you know, and how would that affect the grain boundary segregation. So we use the SPS sample as a model. We anneal the SPS sample for 1350 Celsius for 20 hours. Uh, and a 619 nanometer the average grain size was obtained. And I will refer to the sample as the SPS anneal sample. So just for your overview, we will have total four samples that we, um, that we explored or analyzed in the study. And each one of them has six different type of interfaces, three homo interfaces and three hetero interfaces. The grain boundaries of, the, of our three-phase ceramics were analyzed using scanning transmission electron microscope. 
We are lucky in our mind here to have uh, some of the best microscopes available in the world, electron microscopes available in the world. Uh, for, uh, for my study, I use the aberration corrected jewel grand arm um, that we have here at UCI. Uh, and the samples were made using focused ion beam um, in SEM. Um, all the elemental analysis was done using EDS or energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And the data was analyzed using the Atan microscopy suite. All the EDS data that we obtain, which is called, which is, you know, um, which gives us in in intensity information uh, from the sample, was then quantified uh, to find out how much of the segregants are present at the grain boundary. Now, there are actually various ways um, uh, for quantification um, of, uh, of grain boundary. Um, there are two main ones that I will mention today are what we uh, have used in our paper. And for the details, there are many references here, and please definitely check out my paper, and you will uh, you will be able to find out more of this uh, uh, the details on the experimental quantification. So uh, the most common, generally, the way to describe grain boundary segregation is atomic or weight percent, and the traditional method to do it is using the cliff lorimer method, which basically relates the intensity ratio with the concentration ratio. However, there are some, uh, you know, limitations with it. First of all, you need a thin sample, um, which is typical in uh, TM anyways. The process itself is very straightforward. You get the intensity directly from the sample and you're able to calculate your concentrations uh, from it. But you do need some sort of standards to be able to get this, which is called the K factor, which depends not only on the sample composition, but also on the exact experimental parameters. So this is a variable constant and it depends exactly on what kind of microscope, what uh, accelerating voltage, what sample thickness, what detector efficiency, all of this goes into this term. Uh, however, one disadvantage of this method is that there's not really any information of the grain boundary width. Um, and there's just an arbitrary assumption that, uh, you know, so let's say if I have, I, I report, I have one person, one atomic percent of something, it becomes hard to compare between different researchers and be able to compare your results with, you know, people who are doing similar work in the field. So another way to quantify grain boundary segregation um, is through describing grain boundary coverage, which simply is basically concentration uh, per area. Now this technique assumes that all segregants are kind of lying on a 2D plane at the grain boundary. Um, this technique does require a good understanding of beam to specimen, inter uh, beam to specimen uh, with, within the interaction volume. I think I'm missing a word here. Yeah, within the interaction volume. Um, we use both the cliff lorimer method to give the atomic percent quantification in our study, but we also use the grain boundary coverage uh, to quantify the grain boundary segregation. There are some challenges though, uh, if you are trying to calculate the axis of segregants at hetero interfaces because of the presence of different phases on each side. Now, finally, going to the results um, of our, um, of our, uh, of our uh, paper. So I will first start with the qualitative observations that we had uh, using STEM and EDS, and then I will go into the quantitative analysis. Here you are seeing some representative high annular, um, high angle annular dark field stem images from all our four centered samples. Now these HADF images actually show you the Z contrast. So if you see the presence of high intensity at areas, this likely means that there is a uh, higher atomic number elements present. So here you can see alumina, alumina grain boundary. Uh, uh, where the grain boundary has very high intensity contrast, which shows us that there's some high Z elements present at the grain boundary, but we don't know what yet, which you'll find out soon using it. Also observe the same thing with this high intensity contrast at the grain boundary. For the YSZ, YSZ grain boundary, we see this dark contrast at the grain boundary. Now the dark contrast at the at ceramic grain bound, this is not really as straightforward to interpret. Um, you may think that, okay, the bright means something high atomic number is present, so the dark would mean something low atomic number is present, which is true. It may have low, uh, low, low Z elements present here, but this dark contrast has been shown to be possible due to structural distortion at the grain boundaries also. And it can also be present, uh, it can also occur due to vacancy, cation vacancy or both anion vacancy. 
so that's why uh, like this is the contrast that we will uh, we will have to confirm what's really happening at our brain boundary using EDS. For the hetero interfaces for the spinel alumina hetero interface, we also observe high atomic number um, uh, presence, high atomic number elements present at the brain boundaries. Uh, however, interestingly, for the spinel YSZ and alumina YSZ, we do not see any segregation, and this is also an important finding in the study that it is not it is uh, it is uh, just because some interfaces are showing segregation does not mean that all the interfaces will show segregation and of course that raises questions about why certain phases have segregations and why others do not so here i will show you some elemental eds mapping which will reveal the grain boundary segregants i have used example of the fly center sample uh, the boundaries from fly center sample here so on the top here, you're gonna see the, what kind of grain boundary I'm showing you. Then you will see the stem HADF imaging, which show you the Z contrast. And then at the, uh, at the bottom, you will see um, all the elemental maps um, using the, using the K-peaks uh, in EDS. So here for the alumina, alumina grain boundary, we see Yishim and zirconium segregate at the grain boundary, as well as we have some aluminum depletion if you can see here the change in contrast. For the spinel, spinel grain boundary, we also see yttrium and zirconium segregated at the grain boundary, and we see clear magnesium depletion, but the aluminum uh, depletion is not noticeable. And we confirm with line profile that aluminum does not deplete. For YSD, YSD grain boundary, we see aluminum segregated at the grain boundary, and the zirconium is depleted. On the other hand, uh, uh, the magnesium and yttrium signal um, is, is not changing across the grain boundary. For the spinel and alumina grain boundary, you will see yttrium and zirconium segregated at the grain boundary, but we do not see any depletion of magnesium or aluminum. And for the two interfaces that I mentioned earlier, the YSD spinel and YSD alumina, we confirm with EDS that there is no segregation happening at the green boundaries. What is interesting about these results is that the type of segregation we observe at each boundary is actually, we, uh, we found out it to be qualitatively the same across the four centered sample, meaning that all the alumina, alumina interfaces, whether it's conventional sample or flash sample or SPS samples, they all showed yttrium zirconium segregation. And all, for example, uh, YSZ spinel and YSZ alumina interfaces did not show any segregation. And that made us conclude that the type of segregation does not change with the sintering technique, but mainly depends on the sample composition. And again, this is a very important finding because, uh, you know, uh, different groups or different research, uh, uh, research uh, researchers may be using different, uh, to study the same material using different techniques. And what we're trying to show here is that the type of segregation would not change likely with the, uh, with the sintering technique, but it mainly depends on what your sample is made of. The last part of my talk is focused on the quantitative results of this study um, based on the grain boundary segregation. Here you are seeing peak concentrations of segregated cations uh, at alumina, alumina green boundary. By peak concentration, I mean the maximum segregation, uh, the maximum concentration of the segregants, which is deuterium and zirconium in this case, at the alumina, alumina green boundaries. And here the, con the quant uh, quantification is reported in atomic percent using the clip lorimer method. What's Important to notice here, even if you ignore the numbers, if you just look at the trend, is that the SPS sample, the sample that was not annealed for a long time, shows the highest amounts of segregation compared to all the other samples. When we go to the spinel spinel interface, now things look a little bit different. We see that the flash SPS as well as the SPS annealed sample are showing similar uh, grain boundary segregation uh, concentrations, but the conventional sample is clearly low. For the YSD, YSD interface, which showed aluminum segregation, again, the SPS has the highest amount uh, of grain boundary segregation, while conventional sample has the lowest. And lastly, for the spinel and alumina interface, 
uh, we see the highest amount of segregation at the SPS, uh, SPS um, spinel alumina grain boundaries, while the concentration at conventional flash and SPS annual samples are similar. Now, there are mainly two results um, that we get from, uh, from what I showed you here. Firstly, that on average, the SPS samples show the highest amount of grain boundary segregation, particularly if you compare it to the conventional sample. If you look at all the boundaries in all the boundaries that we analyzed, and each boundary, several boundaries was, was analyzed, the SPS sample is greater than the conventional sample in all of the analyzed boundaries. On the other hand, the, another thing that you may notice is that the flash sample and the SPS annual sample are surprisingly showing similar grain boundary concentration. So you can see here, uh, similar here, similar here, and then also similar here, even though of course these processes are very, very different. So we can derive two conclusions from here. The first one is that the SPS sample is likely showing higher grain boundary segregation because this was conducted at the lowest temperatures and likely resulting in non-equilibrium higher, higher segregation grain boundaries. On the other hand, the other result about the similarity between the flash and SPS annual samples show us that the high temperatures reached in the flash process kind of mimic or have similar grain boundary segregation behavior that you would get from a sample that was uh, annealed for several hours, you know, uh, at, a, at a bit lower temperature. It can, it can have similar amount of grain boundary segregation. Moving on to, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, that we did quantification to, through two methods. Um, so I showed you the atomic percent uh, quantification in the previous slide. What I'm showing you now is the access of segregated cations at the HOMO interfaces only. So here um, you are seeing atoms per nanometer, uh, nanometer quantified for conventional flash and SPS uh, both the SPS samples for alumina, alumina grain boundaries. Now the trends are the same as what you saw in the previous slides. The trends should not change because you're using the same information for, uh, or the same, you know, grain boundaries for its analysis. But you can see again clearly that the SPS sample comparing to the conventional sample is clearly higher on average compared to the conventional sample. And again, the flash and SPS sam annual samples have similar grain boundary segregation. So now to conclude some of the main points that I talked, uh, I talked about uh, in this presentation is that we confirm our hypothesis that the grain boundary segregation behavior in multi-phase ceramics is clearly distinct compared to single-phase ceramics. We saw that the y pure YSV uh, in previous literature had showed yttrium segregation only. When alumina was doped with YSV, we see both yttrium and aluminum segregation. But in our three-phase system with the YSD, YSD grain boundaries, we see only aluminum segregation. And thus, this is a very important result and something for anyone working with, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, ceramics in general, uh, should keep in mind of how the segregation will change depending on your sample composition. Another key result of, um, of this, um, of our paper is that the type of segregation at grain boundaries did not change with centering processes which means that all the spinel spinel boundaries that we analyzed showed yttrium and zirconium segregation. All the alumina alumina green boundaries showed yttrium and zirconium segregation. The YSD YSD boundaries showed aluminum segregation and the spinel alumina boundaries also showed yttrium and zirconium segregation. Again, interestingly, the yttrium alum, uh, the YSD alumina and YSD spinel boundaries did not show any segregation. And what that really means is that the grain boundaries are likely already at a lower, uh, have lower interfacial energy. So the, the cations would prefer to stay in the grains rather than segregating at the grain boundaries because segregation would likely increase the interfacial energy. From a quantitative analysis, uh, we conclude that the SPS uh, process results in higher grain boundary segregation compared to conventional centrings. Um, and this suggests that the low temperatures in SPS will result in non-equilibrium grain boundaries with higher segregation. Uh, another thing that, we, know, uh, that we, uh, we concluded from our quantitative analysis was that the flash and the SPS long annealed samples uh, had similar, uh, had similar quanti uh, 
similar uh, brain boundary segregation. And what that simply means is that the temperatures, because the flash temperature reaches very high, temp uh, very high temperatures because of the electric field directly applied to the sample, the grain boundary segregation in such a sample, even though the flash was only centered for six seconds, the grain boundary segregation from flash sample can actually be very similar to a sample like SPS anneal, which was anneal for 20 hours, be very similar. And lastly, um, I believe that the, both the qualitative and the quantitative results shown in our study will act as a guide for other ceramic systems um, and, and will help understanding how the grain boundary segregation is changed by sintering processes and how it may affect different material properties. Um, there are many more uh, results and discussions that are explored in our paper. I did not include all in this talk. Um, and I hope you guys will uh, I encourage you all to check out the paper. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy, happy to take any questions. And thank you so much for your time.